Our guest today is Ira N. Agnosti, a partner of White & Case in Washington, D.C. Ira spent more than 10 years working for the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance. We're going to talk some Corp Fin-related matters. I'm Brock Romanek, today on Zippy Point. So, Ira, the Corp Fin comment process I hate to say, but when I started in Corp Fin in the late 80s, there were no computers, so we wrote out our comments by hand, and then we would read them after our, our reviewer would edit our handwritten crayon-like comments, and then we'd have to read them to counsel over the phone because we had so few secretaries to type up comment letters that we had to get it out quicker because the actual comment letter would usually go out after the deal was effective. We've come a long way. But it's been gradual changes. And at its heart, you know, a lot of the, the comment process is the same. But there's been a lot of changes, particularly the last year or two. Um, but we're going to get into the basics, too, so newbies out there will understand what's going on. So the first question is, if, if you weren't familiar with this process, is does every filing made with the SEC get reviewed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, thankfully, not every filing. Otherwise, the SEC would be really busy and never get to uh, things on time. But um, generally speaking, the SEC, um, you know, uses a certain you know criteria for selecting filing for reviews. Generally, that is kept confidential. But I think that there is no street secret that you know, particularly initial public offering, you know, IPOs, you know, they all get reviewed. The rest of the filings, it depends on you know what the transaction is, the nature of the filing. If it goes out of automatically, you know, effective automatically, obviously it does not undergo an SEC review. If it gets filed in a preliminary form, such as a proxy statement, the staff has about 10 calendar days to determine whether or not to review a filing. And if you don't hear from the staff by the 10th day, then registrants are free to file the definitive proxy statement. So, you know, the answer is it depends. So when a filing is made with the SEC, there are certain people on staff that screen the, re the filing for review to determine whether or not to select it for some type of review. And we'll get to the different types of review in a yeah. moment. But what's the timing of that when someone, when it lands into Edgar? Um, and then who are those people that, that do this screening? And what is Definitely. the screening criteria? I guess we'll get to that when we decide <laughs> yes. which ones. So, you know, as you know, Corpin underwent, you know, somewhat of a reorg. So they have, you know, like less um, disclosure operations offices. There is about seven now. So they also switched all the SIC codes. But the process internally of who screens the filing has not changed very much. You've got designated staff um, that are generally senior or more experienced, you know, attorneys that are in charge of screening 33 act registration statements or preliminary proxies. Generally, that process in the in the context of a registered offering takes about you know no more than seven days um, you know you've got an initial screener that determines whether or not a filing should be picked up for review and then goes to a second level of reviewer or screener if you will the general is either the legal brain chief or another um, senior attorney within the group and determine whether or not uh, there are you know solid basis for uh, pulling a filing for review uh, generally speaking to the extent that the legal staff has already runs into an accounting issue, then they go and consult with the accounting staff within the, the, the group to determine whether it is an issue, um, you know, a material issue requiring further um, uh, investigation from the staff. And the proxy is pretty much the same. You've got, it um, used to be the, uh, the legal counsel within the group, but that role seems, you know, in the reorg that has gone away, that would review the uh, preliminary preliminary proxy within the 10 day period and then either another senior attorney or a legal brain chief within the group would determine whether there were, you know, a substantive basis for uh, pulling a, a preliminary proxy for review. And then once it's screened, there's three determinations. I think it's still three, no review, monitor or full review. What, what are those? Yes, so uh, you would, should always expect in the context of an IPO that you're going to be pulled for a full review, which means you've got the soup to nuts um, review of the filing by both disciplines, the legal and the accounting staff. You have an examiner and a reviewer, both in the legal and accounting. The review takes about 27 days for you to expect comments from the SEC on the first round. 
Um, and then depending on, you know, whether you have, you know, a registrant that um, it's not an initial filer um, or a registrant that, um, you know, basically has had some reporting history and is filing, let's say, you know, a shelf registration statement on an S3, the staff will screen it. And if there's basis for pulling the filing for review, it may, engage, it may entail only certain uh, specific aspects of the filing, which we call it a targeted uh, review or a monitor review. Generally speaking, uh, the staff has actually been pretty good about, you know, not taking all 27 days on the initial uh, round of comments to review and connect with the registrants. Um, and those types of reviews are happening quite quick, I would say. Um, and then, you know, the third outcome would be a no review, um, which has happened, you know, quite often, I would say, in the last two years, where the staff, you know, in the context of a uh, registered offering would screen, whether it's an S1, an S4, an F1, an F3, and determine that um, you know uh, not to engage in a review, which means that you still will need to you know the issuers will still have to engage with the examiner in the group to um, you know basically to shepherd the filing all through the um, uh, the acceleration request and the effectiveness period. But you're not going through a formal legal review of the filing. Yeah, no review is always good news. Yes. I, I just had one of those good news is recently, so I appreciate it. <laughs> so what is a continuous review? This is, I think, in the 34 Act context and that some companies are always being reviewed in a sense. Yes, so as you know, uh, the SEC has a mandate from Sarbanes-Oxley that, you know, public companies should be reviewed at least every three years. However, the SEC has discretion to, uh, to, to review filings more often, particularly for registrants that are a particular size, they're very important to our, you know, either the economy or capital markets. However, um, there has been a trend, I would say, in the last five years where, you know, SEC reviews do not end up, you know, in comments. So while a, a registrant may be under continuous review by the staff, um, the registrant would not know it because uh, that review would end up with no comments. So um, actually, registrants are quite savvy. They really monitor, um, you know, the years of, you know, when their last SEC review that ended up on comments was in order to gear up to prepare for another round round of reviews, but there, that certainly, so the unspoken continuous review continues to, to take place for um, obviously registrars of a certain, you know, size. And then shifting back to the 33 Act or a preliminary proxy, how will the staff notify you that your filing is been, has been selected for review or maybe that you got a no review? What, what form of communication happens? So it's always been through a phone call. Uh, the staff will c c contact, you know, one of the attorneys that is listed on the cover of the registration statement. In, in the context of the proxy, it's a little harder. So the staff has to do a little bit more investigative work to see who was um, counsel listed on the last registration statement filed for the same registrant. Um, however, more we see it more often that the staff is engaging um, on email communications. So we get an email from the staff saying, you know, the filing will be subject to review or this is not going to be a review, but please provide us with contact information um, in order to engage with um, either the issuer or, you know, copy the attorney that is on the filing in order to keep the communication going, particularly in a 33 Act context when you still have to take the filing effective. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And of course, it makes sense. Uh, email's been around a while. Yes. Um, can you talk the staff into not reviewing your filing if you have some sort of extenuating <laughs> circumstances? So um, managing is sort of, you know, the relationship with the regulator, it's, it's very important. I have to say, having been in the staff and now being in private practice, it helps, you know, knowing, you know, when to step in and when to alert the staff of something is happening or alert the staff of the timing of your transaction. Um, you know, uh, as, as you are aware, you know, particularly SPACs have been, you know, really dominating the, um, the filing review from the staff. And as far as from, a, you know, capital markets, you know, perspective, there's a lot of those IPOs going on and as, as, as well as like despacking, which involves, you know, quite a few series of filings, um, you know, and just recently I was involved in, you know, like the proxy filing and then the registration statement in the context of the, the pipe investment that happens that is very common now in the context of a, of a, of a dispacking transaction. And then 
the next you know, step will be the Super 8K, and then after that is the registration statement for um, the resale of the founder shares or restricted shares. So it's very important to sort of you know let the staff know ahead of time what's coming up, you know, manage that relationship, you know, effectively in order for them to be fully informed by the time that all the series of transactions come, um, you know, uh, you know, come through the Edgar, you know, internal Edgar pipeline, and hopefully you will get a no review. As, as a way of, you know, like really prepping and laying the groundwork and making it easier for the staff to understand what is happening. And then if your filing is pulled for a full review, what is the process, the timing, and, and what can be commented upon? Yes, yeah, so generally speaking, you know, the staff, when you have a full review, um, it, you know, internally at the SEC, we always would say 27 days, but I think, you know, it, it is very common amongst sort of, you know, like the, the securities bar to say, you know, like expect comments in 30 days. But I have to say the first time ever, um, you know, while I was, you know, here, you know, in, in private practice that I got the, the, the comma letter on the 27 days that it was on a Sunday. So I was super impressed. <laughs> they take their deadlines very seriously and you know you would receive um, a uh, common letter um, via uh, an email so distribution of, of the comments are you know uh, very easy and that has been in place for for a while and you know depending on the, the number of comments materiality and the difficulty the level of the difficulty of the comments um, then registrants engage into you know preparing a response to the SEC, preparing an amendment, and generally the reviews of, you know, let's say in an IPO that is always full reviews are a lot shorter than there used to be in the past because of, you know, the level of number of comments have gone down substantially. Yeah, I once wrote a comment letter in a, on an IPO that was 20 pages long, and I don't think that would fly <laughs> these days. And I Not didn't anymore. Any trends that day. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a lot of conflicts, self Related, related party <laughs> transactions in the company and uh, it happened, it was a read. So when comments are made, what form are they in? I mean, I'm, they're, it, it's in a comment letter, it's in a letter form, but you know, how, who sends them? Is it still an accountant in Corp Fin and a lawyer reviewing it with an accountant and a lawyer reviewing their work? How does that all work? Yeah, so that process is still, you know, um, you know, alive and kicking at the SEC. You always have an, a legal examiner and a legal reviewer and an accounting examiner and an accounting reviewer. So the internal process actually has changed quite a bit since I was there. Uh, you no longer prepare comments on Word and then send them and, you know, prepare the exam report and, you know, propose a comment and then put together a comma letter. They have a very sophisticated platform nowadays that, um, you know, everybody inter interacts on that very same platform and generates the common letter and kicks the common letter out once you input the email addresses of the registrants, you know, in it. So from that perspective, you know, technologically, the SEC has made, you know, quite you know, advancements, um, you know, in that process. So um, that was, you know, a, a big undertaking and, you know, it required quite a bit of training from the staff because, you know, the learning curve was uh, extensive on that, you know, new platform. Yeah, I remember when they first required staff to upload their comments, so they were all public, you know, available internally. And luckily, right at that point, I got a job in one of the commissioner's <laughs> office, and I did not have to. I never uploaded yeah. one single comment letter. I didn't, yeah, you know, the much upload much harder is back then to upload things. Now it's push of a button. The upload is a thing of the past because through this process, is done automatically. <laughs> so, what is the process of responding to comments on on, on the private practice side? How does that work? So, you know, um, believe it or not, I did not, you know, take this, the seriousness of your receiving a common letter from the SEC. You know, once you send the comments out and when you're in the staff, you're like, you know, I'm, I'm done, you know, like I hope they take their time to respond, but on the receiving end, it's always, you know, a little bit nerve wracking because you never know, you know, like what the, you know, the staff thought and, you know, maybe they, they you know, like saw an issue that was not picked up during the preparation of the, of the disclosures. So when you see few comments on the letter, it's always like a good day. Um, and, uh, you know, generally it, it is quite, you know, a process, you know, as you know, there is many, you know, parties, you know, within, you know, a filing, whether 
or you were working on an IPO that, you know, you've got the bankers and you've got a company and you've got counsel on both sides, or in the context of, let's say, you know, like a SPAC merger where you've got the target company, you've got the SPAC and, you know, all, you know, the, the sort of the advisors, the banks and the, the lawyers. So it's quite a, you know, process. It's taken very seriously. So people, you know, delve into the, uh, what the staff is looking for and try to be very thorough and try to be very responsive. So uh, during that process, you start to update disclosures. If a disclosure needs to be updated in, to, to respond to staff comment, to the extent that perhaps, you know, the comment is only asking for an explanation, you provide that explanation in response, in the response that gets filed, you know, as corresponds together with an amendment. And uh, depending, you know, issuers always want to do things fast. <laughs> so if they have a choice to, you know, receive comments today and make a filing, an amended filing tomorrow, they could. But generally, in order to do, frankly, a good job, we, we, we advise, um, you know, companies to take their time. And uh, the timing is also essential depending on whether you are in the cusp of financial statements becoming stale. So um, if you need to um, update the numbers, that also makes it, you know, uh, very tricky in terms of, you know, what timeline are you working with? Um, so, and as a matter of fact, you know, um, the, on the 12th tomorrow, it's the last day that uh, non-accelerated filers can go effective on an S1 uh, or S3 for that matter. Um, so uh, the, the financial statements are always a big deal. Always pay attention to that because it will impact, you know, what, you know, steps you need to, to take, you know, in, in the context of your next filing. In the response letter, I assume is the same as in the old days where you would actually repeat what the staff's comment was and then underneath it give your response about whether you're going to challenge it or just say we've made that request to disclosure and it's now on page 12. Is that the way? The That's exactly letter? Yeah. That's exactly right. Yes. You know, we never want to challenge the staff. We always want to be um, very responsive and engage in a collaborative process. And I have to say, um, you know, uh, everybody that I work with, you know, um, since I've left the, 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 the staff, you know, you can always pick up the phone and, you know, make sure that you're understanding where the comments come from. It's not clear or if there's different ways that you want to respond to a comment um, and you want some clarity, uh, they're, they're always, you know, willing and, um, you know, open about discussing it in order for you to put the best sort of response forward. But yes, that process has not changed. Um, there are times when staff engages in providing oral comments and um, the response, however, you know, the staff, you know, always asks that the, the response is provided in writing to an oral comment. Um, there have been circumstances, particularly towards the end of the review, when, you know, there is, you know, timing concerns launching an IPO where the staff may engage in oral comments and accepts that, you know, the, the response to a comment is provided in the amended filing without actually writing a response. Um, while that is expedient, particularly in the context of precedent setting, when you don't have those written comments, you never know why a decision or why the disclosure changed one way or the other. So when possible, I think it's always best practice to, you know, communicate on the record so you know why the staff took certain positions and why a registrar changed the disclosure, especially in the context of areas that are hot disclosure areas, such as non-GAAP measures and KPIs. Yeah, and also you made a good point about picking up the phone because sometimes it drives me crazy when people text or email 30 times when if you picked up the phone, you would know the answer in a yes. second. Because sometimes you, you might not understand really what the staff is driving at. Maybe the comment is not artfully written or you just don't understand it. So rather than try to guess what they're saying, it's much smarter, I think, to pick up the phone call so you save time because you might give a response that doesn't really answer what they it doesn't give them the answer they were seeking for because you didn't understand the comment. And then, so you're going back and forth a little bit where you could have saved yourself some time by just making the clarification. It, exactly. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, we are so deep in the weeds with the document and, you know, sometimes we don't even read the words at, in the page because we have all this knowledge in our heads. And it's kind of great to have a third party that is sort of, you know, um, on, you know, not connected to sort of, you know, like ed, as deeply as we are to give you that, you know, uh, really sounding board of, you know, are your disclosures, you know, clear enough? Are your sound enough? So I like that process because it, I feel like it always helps you, you know, improve upon what you had before. So when you do respond to comments and the staff gets your response, what happens on the staff side then in, in looking at that? 
the process is the same. You know, they still engage into review of, you know, the responses. Um, the staff always has to prepare, you know, what we used to call an exam report that highlights, you know, what the issues were and how they were addressed. And hopefully the next um, sort of, you know, like review ends up in no comments or they will continue to ask questions. Um, you know, as I said, generally you see by the second and third round of you know reviews you know you may be in dealing with a couple of comments not to say that um in the last i would say two or three years have been areas of um of review in the context of you know novel businesses and these unicorns particularly in fintech and you know artificial intelligence or insure tech where there are certain new aspects of disclosure where um, the staff is trying to marry the technology with legacy businesses and how they come together and making sure that disclosures are either not overstated in the context of you know how technology is really transformative of a legacy business to also you know to to, to ensure that um, it's very clear how companies are making money so those filings are actually very interesting and um, you know the staff does engage in quite a bit of you know conversations and you know communications with issuers and you know in more it results are more comments, I would say, than in the typical, you know, IPO. And the staff typically, like in a registration statement, you know, they're if you've made them aware of your time frame, they're working with you. But otherwise, I mean, it's not like another 30 days is going to go by where you can hear whether or not they have a second round of comments or whether they're ready to, to clear you. Yeah, generally amendments, you know, the policy within the corporation has always been, you know, 10 uh, business days, but I have to say uh, staff is very amenable to working with, uh, with the registrants, um, particularly if there is a market window that must be hit and um, uh, it, it's very important to them to not obstruct capital formation. So um, I have to say, rarely the staff and their timing will get in the way of a company really achieving or meeting the goal of getting into the market on time. And then how does the staff ultimately clear comments? Is there any written evidence of that? Yes. Yeah, so in 33 Act context, um, if it is subject to a review, a full review or monitor review. Once um, you know the the filing uh, is basically cleared, no further comments. You'll receive a call from the staff to let you know that you can proceed with uh, asking for acceleration of effectiveness of the registration. Um, in the context of a no review, you will get a, a letter from the staff that says we are not you know basically reviewing this filing, and you're responsible. The management of the company is responsible for disclosures therein. Um, in the context of a thirty. For act report, whether it is um, a, a proxy statement, whether it is a 10K review, at the completion of the review, the staff will issue a comment that says we've completed a review with no further comments. And then at the end of the day, if they did issue comments and you've given some responses, the staff will upload publicly onto the Edgar database the correspondence. So you know, be aware of that. And that's why sometimes it's good to make phone calls. You know, any extraneous emails between you and a staffer, that's not included in that upload that goes public, right? So, so yeah, so interestingly enough, um, there are times when because of the timing and because of the issues that registrants are trying to clear things or pre-clear things prior to filing an amendment and the staff um, sometimes allows communications to happen via email in proposed disclosure and they will ask that that gets filed as correspondence on Edgar and that can become public once the filing is declared effective. So in the context of the 33 Act, if, um, you know, there is, you know, the, the, the transaction doesn't go forward. Um, there is, you know, no effectiveness of that particular registration statement. The correspondence of that review will never become public. You have to have an actual transaction declared effective. And then um, uh, you, within 40 days, um, is it 40 days or 20 business days? I, I forget. Uh, the 20. staff will upload, would upload, yes, the correspondence, uh, both comments and the responses to the comments. Um, so, um, however, that is just an internal policy to make those public. There are times that for whatever discretionary reason, the staff um, may decide not to make correspondence public. So I'm proud of myself for not telling, <laughs> telling too many old man stories about, I mean, I'll tell one. <laughs> you know, coming out of law school, that's back then, that's how you typically got the job. And, you know, you got a job at the SEC, but you had no idea what you're going to be doing much, you know, reviewing registration statements, writing comments. Um, 
but you quickly learn. But I, I feel bad for the first few, co- I, you know, offerings that I reviewed because you literally don't know anything. <laughs> making like stuff in, up as you go. But like in any learn. job. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, thank you so much, Ira. That was very informative. Thank you. That was great.